There's a few years back, a uh, lady had, was pregnant with twins, and she got into a car accident, was in a coma for six months. Uh, when she woke up out of the coma, she looked down and she didn't have any babies, and so she was very concerned and said to the doctor, where are my, where are my kids? What happened to the babies? And the doctor said, relax, relax. It's, it's going to be okay. Uh, you did have a, you had twins. One was a boy, one was a girl. And uh, since you were in a coma, we asked your brother to go ahead and name the children for you, to which the mom was very frantically nervous, and rightfully so. Uh, she said, my, my brother is irresponsible. There's no way. What, what did he name them? And the doctor said, well, uh, he named your daughter Denise. And she said, well, Denise, that's not so bad. I, I guess I've always liked Denise. And then so she said to the doctor, what, what did he name my son? To which the doctor said, de nephew. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was, that was tough. Some of you just got it. You just, you just figured it out. I don't get it. Names are, names are very, very important. Uh, so we've been going through some messages about the names of, of, of God, understanding that uh, when we talk about the name of God, we're talking about character qualities, if you will, or things that how he represents himself in different ways. Um, and the verse that we've been using a lot is Psalm 910. And Psalm 910 says, those who know your name put their trust in you. Those who know your name, those who understand your character, the, who you are, out of, out of that, the, the byproduct of knowing who God is, is a, a trust that forms, and, and, so that's what, and so we've been talking about some 20 different names the Bible talks about. Last week, we, we started uh, giving a couple foundational names, and this should be in your notes if you, you have them out. I just want to review those quick, because the foundational names of God is something that most of the other uh, names are kind of come out of, and so you really need to know the foundational names uh, at, at a minimum. The first one we talked about last week briefly is Elohim. Elohim, you'll find in Genesis 1.1, and it says, in the beginning, God, in the beginning, Elohim. Elohim means creator, God, or supreme, all-powerful, and so most of the time, in most versions, when you see God, you're going to see some sense of Hebrew with that word El. And Elohim, or some 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 uh, derivative of, of of that, and and so there's where Elohim comes from, Yahweh, or really it's Y H W H in in English, no vowels, but some say it's Yahweh, some say it's Jehovah. You're going to find in most translations when you see that that you're going to find the Lord, and it's all capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, uh, the Lord, and and it kind of means. Uh, he is or he will be. It's this idea of self-existence, uh, the Lord, the overall ruler uh, of the earth. And so that's what we mean by Lord or by Yahweh or Jehovah. The third name that we talked about quite a bit uh, last week uh, is found in Genesis chapter 12. And, that, and in chapter, Genesis chapter 12, uh, God tells Abram that you're going to uh, be a great nation. And so in response... Abram leaves his country, everything he ever knew for 75 years, and he begins to head out towards Canaan. 75, 75 years old, he essentially has promised that you, you, know, you will be a father at 75. Um, I am 40, 45, something like that, and um, I can't even imagine having another baby. Uh, anyway, so he heads out in anticipation in chapter 15, about 10 years have passed since that initial moment, if you will, of God speaking to him, and this is where we sat last week. And so if you would turn in your Bible to uh, Genesis chapter 15, if you don't have a Bible with you, there's a gray one in front of you, um, page number 23. At the encouragement uh, of a couple people, I have put these on the screen now, now, if you don't open your Bible, I'll be very upset, though. So, anyway, I can't go into all that. I will sometime. 
But so here's what, here's what Ab- Abraham, here's what Abraham chapter 15 says. Here's what Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 through 6 says. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. We talked last week about what that looks like and how there was some, some fear happening within Abraham's life and he was wandering and God is saying, hey, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm your reward. I'm going to bless you. Abraham re- replies with, hey, uh, O sovereign Lord, which we get the phrase Adonai Yahweh or Adonai Jehovah. It's this idea that he's saying, my master God or my master Lord He's calling on to him as his master, and he says, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Elziar of Damascus? God replies back to Abraham and says, hey, listen, don't worry about it. You're going to, you indeed are going to be a great nation. Uh, a child come from your own body will be you an heir, will be your heir. And so he says, hey, go aside, look at the stars. That's what you're going to receive. And, and so Last week we said Adonai is really this, this two-part word that, that's got both God's sense of being our master, and when we look at master, it's like, not like we deal with master today, but it's, he's saying that he's going to provide, he's going to lead, he's going to guide, he's going to take care of, but the part to that or the covenant part of that is us to follow, which often, let's just be honest, is a difficult part, Correct? Correct? I mean, it's hard for us to follow God. It's hard for us to say, God, I, I, I don't see how this is going to work. I don't, I don't see my way through it. I, I, but as my Adonai, I will give you lordship in my life, and I will follow you no matter where you leave me, no matter what you call me to do, no matter what it looks like, I will follow you. And that's, that's difficult. That's difficult. So that's what we talked about last week. We're going to continue that this week. The story of some of the names that Abram, Abram finds out from God. And then again, next week, we're going to kind of finalize that story as well. So let's kind of move on. Uh, chapter 17 opens up. And in chapter 17, just giving you kind of an update what's happening. Uh, Abram, as you might know, in desperation, uh, had a sexual relationship with Hagar, married her, if you will, had a, a child, Ishmael. It is now 13 years later. Uh, as far as we know, for the last 13 years, God has been relatively silent as far as the text is concerned. Uh, no visits, no voices, no vision, uh, kind of silence. Abram is now 99 years old, and God breaks this long silence with a kind of a fresh identity or introduction of who he is. And here's what he says. Where am I at? Yeah, I'm there. Yes. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. So God, again, promises him that you will indeed be a great nation, that from your womb, from your, not your womb, from you will be a great nation. So God introduces himself as El Shaddai. El Shaddai in your notes means the Almighty. Or a literal translation you could say is the overpower word that he is almighty overpowerer. Here's what God is saying, and this is important. I've told you for 25 years that I will bless you and I'll make you a great nation. I've reminded you at least three times that I will not abandon you, that I'll be with you. Abram, you've been concerned that you're getting old, and you are. Sarah's getting old. Things look bleak. Things look like nothing can happen. But I want you to understand, Abram, that I am God Almighty. Overpowerer. Here's what he says. I am El Shaddai. The all-powerful God that can do anything, anytime, 
anywhere, in any circumstance with anyone. I am El Shaddai, nothing can stop my plans, not age, not time, not your failure, not even your circumstances. I am El Shaddai, nothing can stop me working in your life, through your life, or from your life. Abram, I am El Shaddai. And there's some lessons that we learn about what's kind of happening in just a moment, but the, here's what, I looked up that phrase overpower. Here's what overpower means. Overpower means to gain control over, to overwhelm, to prevail over, to get the better of, to outdo, to gain mastery over, to overthrow, to overturn, to subdue, to suppress, to subjugate, to repress, to bring someone to their knees, to conquer, to defeat, to triumph over, to trounce, to trash, to lick, to best, to clobber, and to wipe the floor with. Anybody needs some Adonai in their life. Overpowerer, conqueror, almighty. Here's things I want to talk about, just a a form. First one is this in your notes. El Shaddai overpowers our failure. El Shaddai is bigger than the failures that you have made in your life. They don't stop him. They don't discourage him. They don't change his course. He's bigger than you. Bigger than your failure. In Genesis 16, we watch Abram and Sarah get impatient. God, you said you'd come through. You said you'd come through. It's been 15 years at least and you're not coming through. And so here's it. We're going to devise our own plan. We'll do things our own way. And so you know the story, right? Abram has sexual relations with Hagar. They have a son. Ishmael, most people believe, is the father of the Arabs. Anybody watch the news this week? Anybody watch what's happening in Israel? We were in Damascus at the Damascus Gate. I'm looking at you guys. I see you in Israel, I think, last week, right? Something like that. Shalom. Anyway. Um, <laughs> we were at the Damascus Gate, and it was pleasant. On the news, it's not pleasant. We were in um, several places that right now, it's, it's just they're throwing stones. And, I mean, in other words, my point is this. Listen, sometimes we make some mistakes in our life, and this is important, and we still had the ramifications of those mistakes, correct? We reap what we sow, but this is important. Even in our failure, God is still supreme. Even though Abraham fails by having a relationship with Hagar and bringing Ishmael into the world, that doesn't stop God from working through Abraham and Sarah and bringing the promised child of Isaac. God is still God. So don't get discouraged because you have failed. Don't give up because you have made some mistakes in your life. Don't call it quits because you think, man, maybe I've just gone too far. God is saying to you and to me, listen, I see what you did, and you're going to reap some stuff from that, but I'm way bigger than your failures. The fact is, there's not a person in this room who has not failed We all miss God. We're human. Anybody miss God? Anybody? Today. Anybody today not like like you miss God today in something, right? The rest of you are super spiritual. I don't I don't. (laughs) Uh, They're very rebellious, very spiritual. I'm not sure which one it is, but but we waver back and forth, we take things in our own hands. We try to do things our way, our plans, our ideas. They just seem easier. Not only, listen to this, this is important. Not only can God overpower our failure, he will also give you supernatural strength to over, for you to overpower your own failure. Does that make sense? Amen. This is important. Not only is God saying, listen, I'm, I'm bigger 
than the failures that you've made that doesn't stop my sovereign ability to control and move and, and do things around people's lives. Not only am I bigger than your failure, but listen, I, because I'm, at, because I'm El Shaddai, can also give you the overcoming power to overcome your own failure. Where your own failure doesn't discourage, doesn't take away, doesn't remove, doesn't uh, uh, discourage from what you can do in your life. That that's the stuff I need to hear. Because sometimes I know that God can forgive and move and and change my life, but sometimes I need to deal with me, my stuff, my failure. I need God to to, 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 to transform my own mess. And as El Shaddai, it's exactly what he promises to do. Number two, El Shaddai overpowers our personal limitations. I love, in a way, in a strange way. I love it because I read the story at the ending. I wouldn't love it. You don't know what I'm talking about yet, but it'll make sense. I love it at the story because I know the ending. I would, not be, I would not want to be Abraham. I love the fact that God waits until he's 99. If I'm Abraham, I'm thinking, seriously, God, you've got to be kidding me. There's a hundred other ways you can show me you're all powerful besides this one. Right? Or even this one. I love, I love from someone have reading the story, the fact that God waits 25 years. Because sometimes we feel like we're waiting on the promises of God for eternity. So I love the fact that he waits that long. How many know Abraham hates that fact? If God's going to tell me something, I'm more like, God, just tell me the day before you're going to do it. Don't tell me 20 years before it happens. I don't want to know. Because I'm just, right? Anybody else, somebody help me. And so he says, so essentially, El El Shaddai is saying, hey, I'm bigger than your personal limitations. The fact that you're 99 years old and, and you're getting a little up there in age doesn't stop the fact that I can still produce a child. And Sarah, the fact that you're 90 years old doesn't stop the fact that I can still produce a child. I love that God is not limited by me. He's not limited by the world around us like gravity. He's not limited by my income. He's not limited by even our personality. I'm an introvert. God don't care. <laughs> Let me just say something real quick. I've never seen more of an introvert than a donkey. Do you know what I mean? If God can use a donkey, he can use you if you just open up your mouth. <laughs> so God is bigger than our personality preference. He's bigger if we'll just trust him. He's bigger than our history. Chapter 21, we see that Isaac is finally born. Why 99? Why so late? Why 90? Here's what I found out, and this has just been, I'm 45, I'm still learning. I have found in my life that God will often put us situations where we will fail unless he comes through. If you're looking for security and comfortable life of just living, you know, and just, you know, knowing where everything is at and everything's dotted and everything's crossed, and I'm just saying you're not even living. You're, you're dead. God gives us a life to be adventurous and living in places that if God doesn't come through, we're going to utterly fail. A story we don't hear a whole lot about is found in Judges chapter 7. Gideon and his men are camped at the spring of Herod. They're getting ready to attack the Midianites. And God says something rather strange, but it's, it's not, I suppose. Here's what God says, Judges 7, 2. Hey, you have too many. You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. Like, when you first read this, you want to say, are you even crazy? The more men, the merrier. Isn't that how it goes? God, how can, I have, you know, how can I have too many men? But there's a point here, and it goes back to this idea that God wants us to understand that the supernatural, the things that happen in life that are worth something only happen when we are least 
and he's greater when we don't have enough and we depend on his provision. So he says to Gideon, listen, Gideon, you have too many men. Here's what I want you to do. Go talk to the men. Anybody that trembles with fear, anybody that is fearful of going into battle, go ahead and tell them that that you can leave. So 22,000 men left. 22,000. How many know it's probably a scary battle? Like 22,000 people don't leave battle unless they are petrified. That's what they do for a living. You know what I mean? Like you fight. That's what you do. 22,000 said, I don't want this. Gideon is left with 10,000. But that's not enough. So what, what, what does God do next? Here's what he does. So the Lord says to Gideon, I can't read, I'm getting old. Here we go. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and, and, and sift, uh, them for, uh, uh, sift them for you there. In other words, he says this, hey, take them to the water and the people that I say have to leave, leave. People that I have to say, uh, stay, stay. And so Gideon's like, okay, I'll do this. So Gideon takes them down to the water and the story goes that and God decides to separate them two different ways. He says, all the ones uh, that drink, uh, you know, with cupping the water, right? They cup the water. It was about 300 of them. So God says, put them to one side. All that ones that, that kind of get on their knees and, and they, they, you know, they gulp the water like a, like a dog would. They lap the water. Is that the right word? Yep. They, they lap the water, separate those on one side. So then you, what you have is you have 300 men on one side and then you have... 9,700 men on the other side. And I think if I'm Gideon, I'm saying, this is awesome. At least I'm only losing 300. <laughs> That's right, guys. Like if you're Gideon, aren't you kind of thinking like that, you know, at least there's only 300 people that I'm going to lose. And so you think that God is going to say something like, all right, Gideon, send the 300 out. I'm just going to use the 97. But it's not what God does. Instead, what God says is, hey, I'm just going to use the 300. 300 people to destroy a nation that 22,000 people were fearful of and ran away. That's 300. Do you get the math? This is how God often works. As an all-powerful, all-knowing God, overpowering anything. He loves to put us in situations where we're forced to depend upon him. If you look at your life, your checkbook, your job, your ministry, the places that you serve, and if you can just show up and you can just serve and you can just do and you can just write the check, can I just say you're not really depending on God? I can say that, right? Get to the place in your life and my life where we simply say, you know what? You are El Shaddai. Overpower, a powerful God. And life is meant to live adventurous. <laughs> and so, help me, God. Help me to trust in you. Help me to follow, even when it just seems ridiculous. That's life worth living. That's life worth living. The story that happens with Gideon and the Midianites is a crazy, awesome story. And I'm not going to tell you about it. So read it this week. <laughs> but you will love the story. Don't do it now. Don't, re- don't start reading ahead, cheaters. Read it this week. And um, you're going to be very, very encouraged by how God intervenes. Let me go to number three. El Shaddai, El Shaddai overpowers even our disbelief. El Shaddai overpowers even our disbelief. You know, we rarely ever talk about Abraham in the sense of where he, you know, where he had some disbelief. But in Genesis 17, 17, it says, Abraham fell face down and he laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? 
Now, we always think of Abraham as the father of faith. But the reality is, is yeah, even Abraham had some moments where he wrestled with God. This is just ludicrous. Some moments of disbelief. God, you can't come through. How in the world? This is insane. Disbelief. Back to Gideon in Judges, chapter, uh, whatever chapter it was, I don't remember. Yeah, it's in your notes. Verse 10 of nine, verse 9 and 10 of that chapter. During the night, this is, this is, this is funny too. God is so funny, you guys. He, he really is. So, <laughs> after, after God, after El Shaddai clears away 22,000 people, after God clears away 9,700 people, and then leaves Gideon with 300 men, God says to Gideon, hey, you know what? <laughs> hey, Gideon, if you're fearful, if you're fearful, hey, Gideon, if you're fearful, if you're a little worried, if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Pura. I, 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 is that funny to anybody else? You guys don't get a sense of humor, I, I guess. Of course he's fearful, but even Gideon. I mean, Gideon is like the father of disbelief, isn't he? Gideon's the guy that says, um, God, if you really want me to do this, put something on my fleece. And, well, you know, do the other side. Wait, that still didn't work. Let me do it a third time. That's Gideon. Gideon's fleece, ever heard of that? So Gideon is one of these guys that like, like he oozes disbelief. And yet God is not hampered or stopped by a person that has a problem believing God for the supernatural. So what do you do with this belief? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with the struggles that when God speaks to you about serving or ministering or about a career change or about just being faithful in your home or whatever it is, how do you deal with that disbelief? I think a great antidote is found in Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And it's a story of Jesus and the disciples who couldn't, who couldn't heal this boy. And so the, the dad's like, you know, what should I do? A boy has an evil spirit. The father says to Jesus, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus says, everything is possible to those who believe. But I love how the father replies. I believe, but what? Help me overcome my unbelief. Church, if you're in a place like I am where you're like, God, I, you know, I want to trust in you as, as my El Shaddai. I, I, I want to put my faith in you. I want to put my hope in you. I, I, I don't want to go to the left or to the right. I want to say yes and say yes and do it, but I have a struggling with believing you. Here's what we do. We come to God and say, man, God, I need your help. Because in my head, in my head, I, I get it. El Shaddai, all-powerful, like, Elohim, creator, uh, Jehovah, Jireh, uh, uh, Adonai. In our, in our head, we get who he is, right? It's our heart. It's the heart that there's this, this blockage between what we know intellectually who God is and what our heart is willing to believe and to trust. And so what our prayer needs to be on a daily basis is, Holy Spirit, would you create a highway between what your word says and what I know and, and help me to believe it and to live it? Holy Spirit, would you help me? That's how you deal with this belief. Get into God's word, read it, study it, Pray, Holy Spirit, help me to believe because I'm having a hard time. And then finally, El Shaddai, even, depending on where you're at, overpowers our suffering. For us, for some of us, it's huge. But El Shaddai, even overpowers our suffering. In the book of Job, in the book of Job, 30 times Almighty is referred to. If you don't know the story of Job, Job essentially lost everything. He lost his, his kids. He lost his, his building. He lost his uh, uh, farm. I mean, he lost everything, his own personal body, what boils. I mean, Job was a mess. And in the book of Job, you have this conversation between his friends, his wife, 
who says Job just cursed, you know, curse God and die. And then you have Job trying to say, Almighty God, where are you in the midst of this horrific life? It doesn't make sense. God, can you bring some meaning to this? And, he, and, and Job really starts to, in, in verses, rather in chapter 31, he really says, um, God, wh- where are you? I, I don't get it. I've lived the life I'm supposed to live, and I've, and I've done what I'm supposed to do. And, and Job starts to almost be tempted to think that maybe he did something wrong. And, and so he, he's debating with God. Anybody ever been there before? Um, and so I relate, right? God, where are you? Where's your faithfulness? I've done everything I can do. I've worshiped you. I've, 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 I've prayed to you. I've served you. I've, I've done everything you've asked me to do. And yet this doesn't make any sense at all. El Shaddai, where are you, almighty God? But listen, listen to how God responds. And I, it's, it's, it's like four chapters, and I'm not going to read all of them for you. But I'm going to read a couple because I, I think perspective is everything. So in Job chapter 38, you're welcome to turn there if you'd like and, and read a few with me. If the Great Bible is page 640, but again, I'm just going to skip around a little bit. Page 640, if you have a great Bible, here's what it says. The Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, and he said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Job, brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Isn't that interesting how God never really answers our question? Even Jesus really answered the question. He always twisted it, you know, to what we needed to hear. Welcome. We're in Job chapter 38. He says, 38 verse 4, where were you? When I laid the earth's foundations, tell me if you understand. Job, who marked off its dimensions, surely you know. Don't you love God's sarcasm? (laughs) Who stretched the measuring line and crossed it? Job, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? Who was there when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped in the thick darkness? Job, Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea? I need you to finish this. Just the ones that are circled. In verse 16, have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. In verse 22, have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hall? of the hail which I have reserved for times of trouble, for days of war and battle. What is the way to place where lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? In verse 31, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? Do you know the laws of the heavens? I can go back. Can you raise your voice in the clouds, verse 34, and cover yourself with the flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do you report? Do they report to you? Here we are. Chapter 39, verse 26, does the hawk take flight by your wisdom, Job, and spread its wings toward the south? 
Verse 27, Job, does the eagle soar at your command or build its nest on high? Chapter 40, verse 2, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him accuse God, answer him. Let him who accuses God, answer him. I love what Job says. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Finally, at the end of chapter 42, verse 1, Job replies to the Lord again and says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted or taken away. You asked, who is it that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to even know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Stand with me if you would. Father, I, I call on you as El Shaddai, Almighty God. Lord, there is nothing in our life that stops you from being almighty, perfect, in control. Lord, our best days are yet ahead. Lord, our best moments are yet ahead. Lord, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's nobody. There's no one. Not death, nor life, no principality, no power, nor darkness can take away from what you want to do in us and through us. You are our El Shaddai, God Almighty. God Almighty. And today we simply say we trust in you. So Lord, I pray this morning for the person that maybe is struggling, struggling to see that you're in control. Maybe the person that's struggling to get past their own mistakes. Maybe the person that's struggling because you've, you've challenged them in some ways in their life that simply is not part of their DNA and they're struggling with obedience. God, today I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just pour out a, a faithfulness, a great sense, not just head knowledge, but a heart knowledge that you are almighty God. Nothing's too hard, nothing's too difficult. Lord, would you pour that out on every one of us, each person that's watching uh, on, on the video screen. Lord, would you pour that out today? Give us faith and trust in our El Shaddai, in our El Shaddai. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, today is a day of salvation. Next week, we're going to talk about Jehovah Jireh, our provider. God provided the antidote to our sin in the person, Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you know that you're not living for Jesus, you're not living for God, you know that you're, you're bound by sin, you know that you've not confessed in, in, in serving him, today God says, listen, I want to call you my child, I want to call you my daughter, I want to forgive you, but you have to call me today. If you're here and you're watching online and you want to call on the name of the Lord for salvation, will you just raise a hand with me real quick and say yes? Today I want to give my life to Jesus. Today I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm not serving him, but today I give him everything. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and he is just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, both past, present, and forever, to cleanse us. So Father, we confess that we are sinners. We ask you to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us, give us a new heart. We accept Jesus Christ as the Lord, as our Adonai, and the Savior of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.
Can we give those that gave their lives to Christ a hand this morning? Can we do that? If you gave your life to Jesus this morning and you're here, um, if our prayer partners could come forward, there's some things we want to give you, just a little book to help you walk in your life and your journey. They're right in their front pews. If you're watching online, please contact us. Um, Next week, we're planning on talking about Jehovah Jireh, our provider. That's what the plan is next week, continuing the story.